We're building up to our elections coverage here on Newsroom Africa. Elections happening in neighboring Zimbabwe. Well, reports out of that country, at least by the Herald newspaper today, that Professor of World Politics at London University, Stephen Chan, was arrested and then deported. He joins us now to talk more about this. A very good evening to you, sir. Uh, grateful for your time. So you have been deported, according to the report by the Herald, because you were in the country to trigger mayhem and train insurgents. What exactly were you doing in Zimbabwe? Well, it certainly wasn't to train insurgents. I'm also a karate teacher. I teach internationally. And I take advantage of my travels to be able to teach people in different countries. So I've been teaching karate in Zambia before I went on to Zimbabwe, and I had hoped to do that as well. But the trip coincided with the Zimbabwean elections in two days' time. I was very happy it did that. And this is because attending elections in Africa, particularly in Zimbabwe, is part of a personal tradition. I was an organizing observer, a key observer in the 1980 independence elections of Zimbabwe. And I've basically attended almost every single Zimbabwean election. So I was very much just wanting to be part of what was happening. I was not, however, intending to write about these elections. It was very, very much to be there at the time, to share in the atmosphere, perhaps to gather material for a longer term project, not only on elections, but also on election observation, since I helped establish the whole practice of election observation in Zimbabwe in 1980. But there was no immediate, as it were, exercise or mission in covering the elections. I wasn't working for any newspaper. I wasn't a member of any observer group. It, it, was basically, if I can coin a term, election tourism. I'm interested that you say you were looking, perhaps, you weren't there in the immediate term to do any sort of academic work, shall we say, around the election. So am I right in saying that when you were given permission to go into the country, it was with the sole purpose of teaching karate? Well, basically, I went in on a tourist visa because I was I wasn't making any money out of doing anything. I wasn't, as it were, teaching karate for money. I've never done that. I've taught karate all my life around the world, free of charge. I've never earned a single penny for it. I wasn't writing for any newspaper, so I wasn't making any money for that. I wasn't being paid per diems by any observer group or anything like that. So my intention was basically to go in as a private citizen, and as I said, be there at the time of the elections. So I thought obtaining a tourist visa, which I had, uh, was probably the best way of entering the country. So what then were you told at the time of your detention and subsequent deportation? Very little. Uh, they were waiting for me at the airport, um, and they were, in fact, waiting at the aircraft door when I emerged from my flight from Zambia. They simply said, follow us. So I followed them. It was very, very clear that I wasn't going to get much choice in this matter. The only question they asked me was, where do you want to be sent? Do you want to be flown back to Zambia, from which you've come? Or... Professor Chan, are you still with us? Okay, I think we're having a bit of a connectivity issue there. We're speaking to Professor Stephen Chan, who was deported today, as we're hearing from Zimbabwe, he was, says he was there on a tourist visa, teaches karate, uh, and was hoping to do some of that work, but also to be in the country during these elections. I'm not sure if we're able to get him back, because there are quite a few issues here worth discussing. Professor Chan, I see that you're back with us. You were telling us that you were then, you basically had officers waiting for you at the doorstep of the aircraft. And, okay, let's hang on a moment, because I see here on my monitor that we're reconnecting with Professor Stephen Chan. By the way, while we wait to see if that's going to work out, um, various angles worth following within the Zimbabwe story because as things stand now, we're just under 48 hours from the election itself. And many people, it'll be interesting to see if many of Zimbabweans who are in places like South Africa will be traveling home, perhaps in the early hours of tomorrow, to participate in the election. Both the MDC, not the MDC, but the Triple C, led by Nelson Chamisa, the main opposition leader, and the incumbent, Enemis uh, Mnangagwa, have been out even over the weekend, putting in that last effort to get voter support. Uh, Professor Chan, I'm told we have you back. Uh, we lost you just as you were telling us about how 
the people who stopped you, tell us who they were, and they said to you, the question was, where do you want to be sent? That's right. And I had a choice of being sent out of the country, either back to Zambia or to the United Kingdom, since I travel on a United Kingdom passport. So it's very, very clear I was not going to be allowed to come into Zimbabwe. They never asked me any other questions. I mean, they're very, very polite, but basically they didn't ask questions or explain themselves in any way whatsoever. I was simply assumed that I had to do what I was told. So I left the country and came back to Zambia. I didn't want to fly all the way to the United Kingdom. So I'm back here in Zambia now, and I've been reading the various reports about what happened. Mm -hmm. I've learned more from those reports as to what happened than I was told at the airport. I was told almost nothing at the airport itself. And the people who greeted you then as you came off the flight, were they immigration officials or just regular police? They weren't regular police. They were wearing uniforms of some sort. Uh, but uh, I think they were joined by an immigration official. But the person who was doing as were most of the leading, I had no idea what service, what branch of the security forces, or what branch of the immigration service he came from. Although he was wearing a uniform of sorts, it was not the same as those in the immigration department elsewhere in the airport. And I never got to see his badge. They never showed any identification at any point in time. Were you mistreated in any way, physically? No, I was simply told to follow them. I maintained my dignity and as much of my courtesy as possible uh, throughout the entire proceedings. Uh, I have to say they did not abuse me, they did not mistreat me, but they did make it clear that I had no choice in the matter. Mm. Well, it, it says here that you also, and by here I mean the, the report by the Herald, which I'd imagine you've now seen, they say that you're also in fact um, an advisor, they describe you as a well-known government critic and Triple C leader Nelson Chamisa's advisor. What is the nature of your relationship with the opposition leader? I had one meeting with Nelson Chamisa on my visit last year, in which I offered some advice, which he declined. So although we were able to have that meeting, um, I'm not really certain I can say in any way whatsoever that I, I am an advisor to Nelson Chamisa. He did not like my advice. It made front page news of the newspapers at that time a year ago. He did not follow the advice. I've never seen him since that single meeting. It's a complete exaggeration to say I'm his advisor. Now on that visit I also made an appointment to see the president, President Minagagwa, and his office accepted and made an appointment which was then cancelled at the very last moment, literally 40 minutes before I was due to go to his office. So I've always, in my academic life, reached out to both sides. Now, I'm not an advisor to President Minagawa, and I'm not an advisor to President Chamisa. I got on very well with the previous leader of the opposition, Mr. Morgan Chankarai. Mm -hmm. But even he and I had differences. I see it. I accept your criticisms. So I've been critical of everybody, which I think is what an academic should do. But perhaps that's why you were flagged then, if you had an enduring, not, I want to, let me remove the word enduring, if you even enjoyed, enjoyed a relationship of some fashion with a long-time opposition leader such as Morgan Changdai, and we know how he was treated by the political establishment, the ZANU-PF government, to the day of his death. Do you think that you've been perhaps on the radar of authorities as since then as a perhaps, quote, problematic figure? Well, I think they certainly regard me as problematic because they don't know where I stand. But that's because, as I say, I stand in the position of an academic critic of all sides. That doesn't mean I can't have friendships with them or have a drink with them. And I do that with members of the government as well. Uh -huh. I'm not, as it were, saying you're contaminated in some way by wickedness. I will never associate with you. If you want to invite me to the bar of the Rainbow Towers, I'm quite happy to come. I'm quite happy to buy the drink, in fact. So I'm open, but I do absolutely reserve the right to myself as a practicing academic, as a very well-known academic throughout the world, okay. to be honest, to be critical. For those of us who missed it, A, what is the advice that you gave to Nelson Chamisa? 
when you did meet the one time, as you say, and B, what did you want to discuss with President Nangagwa to the point where you got through making the appointment but were basically stood up? What I was discussing with Mr. Nelson Chamisa was my sense that he needed to name a shadow cabinet so that he appeared to the outside world as more than just a one-man band. In other words, my concern was, did he have a government waiting or was he simply a president in waiting? And I saw who was responsible for what portfolio and tried to come to an understanding that the government as a whole of the country should the season mm -hmm. You can't run a government as one person. So I wanted to know, and I did advise him, that I thought many other people wanted to know who his ministers would be. And it's the practice of opposition parties around the world to have a shadow cabinet. And I saw no reason why I should not offer that advice to him. As for what I wanted to discuss with President Menegagwa, I wanted to discuss what progress he felt he had made since he had become president. The West was prepared to give him a chance after the overthrow of Mr. Mugabe. And the British even allowed a minister, the Minister for Africa at the time, Rory Stewart, uh, to come to the inauguration of Mr. Menengagwa. So as I said, the West was prepared to give some time of day for him. Now, it's obviously gone wrong, gone wrong in quite a substantial way. And I wanted to discuss with Mr. Milagagwa where he felt the relationship, which was promising at one point in time, where he felt it had gone wrong. What then do you make of the unfolding situation in Zimbabwe? I mean, you've now been deported. Last week, we spoke to Chris Marulena Sadafkin with the organization Good Governance for Africa. He, too, and his team of researchers were deported from the country. Um, some international media at this stage don't even know if they'll be accredited to actually cover events on election day. Is it all linked or are these isolated incidents? And if so, to what end? I am told, and I don't know whether or not this is just a rumor or whether or not it's true. I've got no way of verifying it. But since this happened, uh, people have been in touch with me and they've been saying things like, there's a hit list. In other words, there's a list that has been prepared in advance of people who should not be allowed to come into the country. So obviously, Chris Marolang and I myself would have been on that list. In the case of Marolang, I think it's also a travesty he was not allowed in. When you read the publications of the Good Governance Africa, which cover every part of Africa, they are an honest attempt to provide in-depth briefs on each African country that it covers. They're not as if we're picking on Zimbabwe in particular, they also are being critical of many people, many figures, many political leaders in many countries. In other words, they're doing precisely what a responsible, politically oriented, but not interfering NGO should do. And having at least tried to speak to both sides in Zimbabwe, you had at least one engagement with Chamisa. Which of these two men would you say um, has perhaps the best set of ideas to move Zimbabwe forward and the best chance at achieving that? Well, I think that there's a general consensus that whoever is the best man, and if that best man is Mr. Chamisa, he's not going to get the chance in the immediate future. There's the sense that the election is predetermined. I can't make a judgment of that. I'm going to wait for the reports of the accredited international observer groups uh, some of whom are led by people that I know. I mean, I've personally met uh, President Goodluck Jonathan, who's heading up the African Union Observer Group, for instance, and I know figures from the other groups. This is purely because of my travels around the world and meeting other people who are concerned with African affairs. But I don't think he's going to be given the chance. Whether he would be a good president or not is a big question because he's never had the chance to exercise, as it were, a platform for his ideas. What he does bring to the table, and which I think is very, very important, is youth. You know, the liberation generation is very old now. Everyone 
is in late middle age or in actual old age. And I'm a great believer that you've got to step aside. You've got to let the younger generation with new ideas take over. So Chambisa would have brought youth, vigor, and energy, and new ideas, I hope, to Zimbabwe, which desperately needs it. It's a country now which twice has set the world record for inflation. It's the country which now twice has had the world's highest economic deterioration. So you can't go on with old ideas. Um, as they say here in Zambia, let the young man try. And I absolutely think that might be a good idea for Zimbabwe. Okay, Professor Stephen Chan, good to speak to you. Uh, deported from Zimbabwe today, now back in Zambia where he's teaching karate at the moment.